opportunity to... All right, DEF CON! How tired of you ask, or how tired are you of people asking you how you're doing? Yeah? Cheer really loudly if you're really tired of that. All right. The other thing I'm trying to do is get people out there to realize how good a time you guys are having in here. So I'm going to say, um, no one doesn't like cake, right? I mean, cake is universally. Can we all cheer for cake? Yeah! Everyone out there, come in here. All right, folks, welcome to uh, another Creator Stage talk. We have some killer folks here to talk to you about some very pressing issues. And I know we started out with cake, which is gonna be the high mark. We're gonna be talking about healthcare, cybersecurity, medical devices, whistleblowing, and a bunch of other really cool stuff. In some sense, can be a little bit of a downer. So I don't have any trigger warnings or anything for our panel, but the only thing I'll ask is for the audience, uh, we'll have an opportunity for a little Q&A at the end, unless we go really over. Uh, but just be respectful of the community and other folks, uh, because sometimes this can be a really personal thing as we're gonna talk about. I think the first thing we're going to do is actually go down the line and do introductions. And before I do that, can you guys hear us okay? I know we're competing over here. You guys are good? All right. So let's go ahead and uh, we're just go right down the line. Matt on and go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell the uh, crowd what you do. And uh, we'll get going on to the real good questions. All right. After you. Sounds good. Um, I'm Matt Hazlett. I'm the Chief Regulatory Officer at MedSec currently. I most recently left the FDA a couple weeks ago. Um, I was at the FDA for eight and a half years, um, started getting very involved in the cybersecurity policy um, and implementation efforts. So I was very involved in the pre-market cybersecurity guidance, writing a significant portion of that um, and oversaw, oversaw our implementation efforts. So the reviewer resources training of how we were going to review cybersecurity given our new statutory authorities. Give it for Matt. Woo! All right. Hi, everyone. I am Erica Chung. I'm currently the executive director of a nonprofit called Ethics and Entrepreneurship. Uh, my interest in the safety of medical devices started off at my very first job when I was 22 years old. I was a lab associate working for a biomedical company called Theranos, which ended up being a $9 billion fraud scandal, which I was one of the key whistleblowers who reported the company to regulators that stopped them from utilizing a faulty device on patients. And uh, I am also involved uh, as a board member of Whistleblowers of America which we provide mental health services and peer support for whistleblowers across the United States and also a advisor to the Signals Network, which is an agency that helps whistleblowers with legal advice, uh, safe housing, uh, funding, job placement in the event that um, they are in need of those services. So. Give it up for Erica. Hey everybody, um, I'm Andrew Carney. Uh, I'm a program manager at a relatively new federal agency, ARPA-H, where I work on healthcare, cybersecurity, uh, patient data privacy. Um, I'm also the program manager for the AI Cyber Challenge at DARPA. Uh, so if you haven't already, please come visit us next door uh, and spend some time there, have some fun. And before all of that, um, I spent most of the last 15 years as a vulnerability researcher and a painful CTF player. Um, and I am now semi-retired from that fabulous pastime. Um, please go check out DEF CON CTF as well if you haven't. The folks put on an amazing game. Um, and I'm super excited to be, uh, so the last year uh, plus in healthcare, uh, looking at the, health, the cybersecurity of healthcare and um, coming from a very offensive kind of mindset, uh, just seeing what we can seeing what we can do from a defensive kind of position and, and really um, hoping to supercharge kind of our efforts to safeguard uh, this, this sector. Give it up, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nitin I'm the Deputy Director of CISA. Hopefully you've heard of us in some way, shape, or form. Um, and it's my, earlier in my career, I was actually a hospital administrator and a flight medic. So I started my career in healthcare, so it's great to be here today to merge cybersecurity and healthcare together and talk about what we can all do uh, to continue to make the sector more safe. 
Thanks. All right, so we're gonna, yeah, this is, give it up for the whole panel. <laughs> Try to beat them out next door. Woo, give them a clap. All right. I think it's important to level set a little bit, but I want to take a poll of the audience real quick. Raise your hand if you work in healthcare, some adjacent field. Raise your hand. Oh, there's no one in this audience. This is all brand new for you, I take it. Just kidding. It's like everyone. It's like my high school reunion out there. All right. I do think it's important for us to level set a little bit, and we're going to talk about threat land landscape a bit. I have some, a uh, little bit of a couple of slides at the end. But, uh, Deputy Director, if you could tell us a little bit more in about the threat landscape and what you're seeing kind of nationally about healthcare ransomware, because, and just healthcare threats, generally speaking, just give us a little bit of uh, a one-on-one, -on -one. what do you see? Yeah. Thanks, Christian. I think the, the big thing we're trying to message out to folks is we look at the healthcare sector, we're seeing an increase in the volume, frequency, and complexity of attacks against the healthcare sector, not just in the United States, but globally. I think when we think about healthcare, if we go back to kinetic warfare going back centuries, we never attacked hospitals, right? We always protected healthcare providers. We always protected the tents with the Red Cross on it. We never attacked those institutions. But today we're seeing attacks against healthcare organizations throughout the country. This is not just about urban America. We're seeing attacks against rural America as well, where arguably healthcare systems are more critical in those communities, given the access to care and the access to backup care is much further away and the consequence of patient safety is even greater. You know, as we look at a lot of, everyone has published a top three or a top five list of ransomware attacks or, is it, or, or sector impacts. Healthcare continues to be in that top three and top five list of every list that I see as sectors that are being attacked by our adversaries. And we're not just talking about nation states. We're not just talking about China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. We're seeing cyber terrorists and cyber criminal organizations also attacking healthcare. Why they foresee money there. They know that I, I think healthcare facilities are kind of one stop shops. You have access to PII, you have access to billing information, you have patient information, you have information that essentially people don't want out in the public space that you can get a hold of. It really is that one stop shop, and our adversaries know this. So we're continuing to see this increase in attacks against healthcare, which is why it's even more critical today to make sure that we're building resilience across the healthcare space. And when we talk about healthcare, it's not just hospitals. It's that entire spectrum that's needed for healthcare to be delivered. So it includes medical manufacturing, distribution, pharma, labs, blood, biotech, health IT, insurers, payers, HMOs, that entire spectrum that's needed for that, that clinical care to be delivered. And we want to make sure that we're continuing to build resilience across the board. That is awesome. And I have a couple of slides to now take a little bit of another audience poll here. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been, uh, had your uh, medical records leak or be breached. Raise your hand. All right, that number is growing every time. I'm going to just take a gut pull here for anyone brave enough to raise their hand. Has anyone had their ca clinical care impacted by some type of cyber attack? Maybe your appointment was canceled. I'm seeing a couple hands. Maybe you couldn't go to the hospital that was nearby. You heard about that. Now there's a couple hands. That's going to increase because what are we seeing now? You know, 2024 has been a banner year for healthcare ransomware. And we're seeing big attacks and some not ransomware things like CrowdStrike. But what I wanted to show you guys is for those of you who don't really work in this very often, now it's not just about privacy of data. It's not just about uh, the financial threat. or It's also about threats to clinical care and human life. And so here's uh, some social media I grabbed based on one of these attacks this year about people that were working. These are doctor and nursing, nursing forums uh, on Reddit and other places where they basically talk about their experience working at some of these hospitals during a ransomware attack. And so in true DEF CON fashion, it's stuff like largest attack, uh, largest hospital system in the country is under attack. No one knows where the forms are. We got a uh, separate sign out. Nursing nursing staff was trying to communicate what medications patients are on, had to do stuff from memory. We were just told the internet may be out for days. We're still on our previous owner's network and they're down in multiple states. And then there's a nursing comment here. Vermont here, they never taught me how to use paper chart in nursing school. What about this one? 
We brought a trauma patient to an Ascension hospital and the trauma team was freaking out because the team, half the team didn't get the page or notification. They're down doing paper charts, handwriting orders, and doing consults over their personal phones. The top comment says they couldn't get Tylenol for a patient that needed it for two hours. We also learned a lot about critical connected infrastructure this last year with things like CrowdStrike, where it wasn't even an attack, but we saw huge amounts of hospitals go down as a consequence. And this is a couple social media grabs I pulled uh, for the CrowdStrike issue. I swear to you, I pulled this image on the left here right off of Reddit. So when the hospital went down, they took all their patients and they had to write them on a whiteboard where they were, what their name was, and what the current issue was. On the same whiteboard below, they drew this picture. The ICU telemetry monitors are down. They said that the ones in the NICU weren't operational. They're unable to upload labs. How many of you folks think this type of stuff is really important? The ability to do laboratory tests and imaging and do things in the electronic health record? Raise your hand. How many of you feel like doctors and nurses can't be good at the jobs of taking care of their sick patients without these things? Raise your hand. You are correct. And so we're going to go into kind of the first question at the tip of this little period here. Cyber attacks degrade, delay, disrupt, and decay the digital systems that power timely, life-saving medical care. And for this, we're going to go into this Q&A and try to get some amazing insights from the folks here, but I also remind you there's an opportunity at the end to ask some, to ask some questions yourself. So first question has to do with a lot of what we continue to learn more about every every year is this interdependency. So after 2008, the financial crisis, the nation went under a painstaking process to try to better understand and map the dependencies of the financial sector, to understand if this bank fails, what will happen to the rest of it. In 24, 2024, we've seen a bunch of attacks, change, ascension, and then not CrowdStrike was an attack. But the question I have for the first part of this panel is, should the US undergo a similar mapping exercise, right, where we understand where the critical interdependencies, third-party risk are of healthcare delivery organizations in this country, because to my knowledge, no one knows what's going to happen. No one knows where the linchpins of linchpins are. We have a pile of them. So the first question is, what do you all think about mapping the sector dependencies and what we should do about that? And this is not a new thing, and we've been doing it for a little bit, but let's learn about it now. What's going on? So I'm happy to go first. I'm a huge fan of mapping out the sector. It's something I tried to do actually when I was at HHS back in 2009. I think the challenge is it's getting that visibility. And I think we've made some progress. CISA right now is trying to look at uh, cascading consequence analysis. And part of that is really understanding, mapping out the sectors, understanding where those critical nodes are. I think, so we are much further ahead than where we were 20 years ago, but I still offer, we're still nowhere near where we need to be to truly understand those those inter, those interdependencies between sect, within a sector, much less between sectors. I think the other part of it is is getting the visibility to understanding, you know, the the actual you know software platforms and the other challenges. So it's one thing to say that the connections exist between this type of financial system and healthcare and and agriculture and those types of entities, but to get to that next level to understand the market space to understand that is just a massive undertaking. We've done, there's pockets of it. There's a great report from 2013 um, that looked at uh, working through the Department of Commerce that looked at understanding global supply chain issues for pharmaceuticals and some medical devices. So there's pockets of this type of information out there, but we don't have the ability yet to kind of coalesce it. Uh, we've launched a recent IT tool called STAR that we're trying to use to really understand some of that, but it's still at a very macro level. There's a lot more that needs to get done. A lot of that information is proprietary, so getting access to it is somewhat of a challenge. And then, frankly, the question I always ask when, when we think about how the government should be asking questions and getting information, the next question I, ask, I always ask is, what are we going to do with it? I never want to be in a government agency where we're asking for information that we don't actually we can't actually use to have some return on investment and value back to the people providing information. And understanding what that looks like is another piece that we're trying to figure out. How do we get information and how do we ensure there's an adequate ROI back? to those information sharers that can help them increase their cyber defense posture. Yeah, just uh, kind of building on that, I mean, the, the it's really interesting talking to different stakeholders, um, in, in both industry and government, about their uh, 
their their introspection into kind of the interdependencies and then um, the acknowledgement that there may be common good kind of upstream um, but perhaps a reticence to actually provide the information that would enable that common good to manifest um, and so there we've you know um, talking to folks over the last year and sort of trying to identify like how do we get a lot of value from investment of public kind of public interest of taxpayer dollars from a research perspective, from a, from a kind of transition or ops perspective, um, how do we find those really high value points to to insert, inject kind of like support? Um, and, and it requires collaboration at a pretty large scale, um, but it doesn't necessarily require exposure, uh, like for, you know, the folks that are, that we would need to kind of talk to, that we are talking to, um, you know, folks are getting braver and that's a very good sign and sort of recognizing that this is, uh, you know, we, we all we all win together or, or we all lose. Um, so I think we're making progress, but we could definitely make progress faster. I'd say on the medical device side, it's incredibly interesting to think about how to scope such an exercise because you're going to have differences. The medical device landscape is incredibly complex when you're ranging from implants to bedside equipment, capital equipment, software functions that only operate on a mobile device or in the cloud, then looking at what's actually used in different facilities and whether there's a differentiation between similar devices from other manufacturers. So if you have one issue from one device type, do they have a backup that can still have some continuity of care? Um, we've also seen a lot of discussions around uh, hospital CISOs trying to figure out how to respond to ransomware and what devices are relying on network or external connections because the initial response is to pull that network down and retract um, in order to better defend the larger ecosystem. Um, but we've seen instances where all of a sudden the product security people are running to those CISOs before they flip the switch um, to tell them that if they do that, they have surgeries in progress that would be interrupted because they're losing that live access. Um, so how do we maintain that continuity of care in response and how do we know what would be impacted based off of different actions that could be taken to resolve some of these issues. So the mapping can get incredibly complex. Uh, so then it's the, how do you approach it and how do you make it useful for the facilities that are using it as well as useful for government regulators to help in response activities as well. Kind of a terrifying thought. Um, so many times when I think about these types of problems, I'm always like, surely someone has done this. And surely we have really great data on this. And so the thought of that, we don't really even understand these interdependencies at any deep level and certainly don't have uh, visibility over the entirety of the problem makes me think about how many other CrowdStrike like issues we're going to have. Or like what's going to happen when, uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, when there's only really three or four electronic health record vendors in the whole country um, and we don't understand the technical plumbing behind it and can understand what's really going to happen when, when something goes down. All right, we're going to go to question two here. All right, this, this question does not apply to anyone in this room, I guarantee it. Just kidding, it's everyone. Health hackers, cybersecurity professionals employed at health systems, medical device manufacturers are often not considered whistleblower protections unless they see criminal activity. But we hear time and time again from folks in these spaces that they see problems and they can't fix them. And they're increasingly worried about what would happen when these issues are not fixed. So my question to the panel is really just talking about uh, should we expand protections to folks in technical healthcare roles, or you could say technical roles more broadly, that offer some protections when they don't necessarily cross the line of criminality, but they believe in good faith that there is going to be some issue before the ransomware hits. Um, so maybe also talk, take it away. So, so I think when these whistleblower um, complaints sort of come about, you have to understand where they exist. Is it happening internally in the company? 
And is there a concern that you can address with the internal controls that exist within a company? And a lot of that is, do you have the leadership buy-in? Do you have the board buy-in to take cybersecurity concerns seriously? And how do you sort of implement that culture within that organization to have them say, this is a top critical issue in order to maintain good business practices, to, in order to maintain uh, patient safety by the examples that you have seen. And so there's a lot of work to be done in terms of what can the infrastructure within an organization look like so the people that are working with these technologies can action on them appropriately. And then there's the sort of external whistleblowing. I've tried to basically work within my organization. It doesn't seem like these issues are going to be addressed. So what do I do now? Who do I turn to in order to prevent some major crisis from happening? And I will say if there are lines that are crossed, if say a company does not make a disclosure about a hack that has happened, then there are ways in which you can report to the SEC that they didn't make the appropriate disclosures for the information that was granted, and you are covered under federal whistleblower protections in those cases. And then there are also several different whistleblower protections that exist at a state level, but it has to sort of pay attention to what those agencies are. Uh, and then it also depends what type of regulatory agency. Are you talking to the HHS? Are you talking to the SEC? who are the appropriate parties involved that can help guide you through the process of getting the concern addressed. Uh, whether it's patient information that shouldn't have been disclosed, that is disclosed, whether it's a ransomware attack, that instead of sort of addressing that and submitting that to uh, the FBI or, or someone else that that happened. Um, and with those, there should be expansion of those protections for some of these people, but it's also about kind of turning back to the internal controls. What most of these people who are reporting these concerns are concerned about are, can I maintain my anonymity? If I can't maintain my anonymity, will I be able to keep my job? Am I going to face any type of retaliation? Uh, are, is there going to be litigation involved? Is there going to be public backlash? What, am I going to get blacklisted from my career? And so I think that's some of the things fundamentally and structurally, both in terms of like how we treat people who report concerns, in addition to the sort of uh, external infrastructure that we need to take into consideration, um, considering we're seeing so many people speak up about the fact that they're seeing these attacks, but they don't really know what to do because there's not necessarily enough external pressure to address them just yet. So I think those are some of the fundamentals to pay attention to uh, when it comes to working with people who are, are concerned about these issues, but the regulatory landscape isn't as, as clear cut yet. Raise your hand if you've ever worked for a healthcare organization, you had some real concerns about the security, you raised them a bunch of times and then nothing happened and you found a new job. Raise your hand. Yep, that's a common story. No, there should be more hands up. I've talked to you guys at bars. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, any, any comments? I'm going to pull a little bit of a thread out of that if that's all right. I was just amazed at the work that you do to support whistleblowers and one of the things I learned is how much you do to support the mental health and well-being of these whistleblowers as they go through incredibly stressful situations. I imagine there are folks in this audience that feel similarly those stress and pressure and if we could just take a moment if you have any advice, suggestions, anything that folks out there that might feel some of those constraints uh, that they could access yeah, I, you know, I always tell people whistleblowing is a last resort. Uh, you shouldn't really rely on like one David against a Goliath for some of these issues. So the best way to help whistleblowers is usually to figure out how to build the infrastructure to address concerns early um, because it's an incredibly stressful process. I haven't met a single person that this hasn't deeply affected their families, uh, their mental health their careers, their professions. It's an incredibly stressful process that is very difficult to negotiate and navigate. Uh, so people who ever witness someone in that position, the more support infrastructure you can build around those people, the better they're going to fare. Uh, and then if they are, if you are in a position that you're reporting a concern, 
the biggest piece of advice is try to find a lawyer, a lawyer you can work on contingency and not just the lawyer that uh, your company provides because you need someone who's going to protect your own interest and really show you the landscape of how you can appropriately pr protect yourself. And then additionally to that, um, you know, there are lots of advocacy agencies, nonprofits that are here to help and to support people who are going through uh, that tough process, um, whether it's whistleblowers of America, whether uh, it's different regulatory agencies that have a budsman's programs that are meant to really support the people who are, who are coming forward. Um, but make sure you have a good support network of the right people through it, uh, because it, it's, it's really critical um, for people in that position. So give it up. That really great stuff. All right, we're gonna shift back gears to some medical devices. All right, there are no legacy medical devices in hospitals anymore. We fixed the problem, right, Matt? You fix it? No. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't have trillions of dollars. <laughs> They're often cited as a major source of risk for hospitals. Uh, they have antiquated operating systems, unpatched remote vulnerabilities. They're often uh, deployed on super flat networks. Um, and this is not just a problem in rural America or in poorly resourced hospitals. I mean, we see similar types of uh, really concerning implementations, deployments in larger hospitals as well, some of which you might actually get care at. Um, the question I have for here is talking about upgrade. And I think this is going to be a really important thing to talk about. How can we take this problem of patching legacy medical devices um, that should have, many people would thought would have been solved by now, like 20 years ago. You think people would have been like, oh, we're not going to be talking about this at DEF CON 32 anymore. So clearly what we're doing isn't working. What's some new approaches we can get at, Andrew, that I think would be a good opportunity for us to, to get into? You are very kind, Christian. You're very kind. Um, so, uh, yeah, the legacy medical device problem, uh, or the legacy device problem generally, is especially problematic in healthcare because of how many devices we use to provide care, to provide high quality care. Um, and so, getting the most life out of a system that's still performant, right? There's a lot of value in that. Um, but if the the security pieces of that, if the if the security or connectivity or interoperability elements of that uh, device, despite its ability to provide care, maintaining you know being sufficiently performant. If it can't, maybe not, I would have, if you would ask me 15 years ago to de de develop a device that would be safe from today's threats, I'd be like, nope, can't do that. Um, so, you know, how we think about this space. Uh, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, thank you. They're clapping for you. That's very nice. Yeah. Uh, DEF CON next, everybody. Amazing. <laughs> Um, so I think, uh, so you have this large complex ecosystem with lots of different vendors, lots of different stakeholders. You have providers that are doing every, like their, their focus should remain on care. I have a small aneurysm. Everybody tell any, every time someone tells me that better training for clinicians will solve like hospital cybersecurity. Like I just, I flip the table, rage quit and leave immediately. Like ideally we want to get to a place where clinical staff don't think about the cybersecurity of the systems they're dealing with. That's, that's the dream. Um, but we still have this very complex, diverse tech ecosystem to deal with. Um, and so how we do that, and how we do that in a way that is context sensitive to each different clinical environment, to each different department, um, that's not something that I've seen addressed uh, in industry, kind of like enterprise tooling, like does not hit the, it's not looking at that problem space because it's really hard and there's not necessarily like the upside, I think, to them from, from an investment standpoint. So uh, at ARPA-H, we are looking at how we can invest and create the next generation of tools to address that space so that all of the hospitals, all of the clinical environments in the US can have like more performant care of their own kind of healthcare technology ecosystems. Um, so we can understand what's there, kind of going back to this mapping question from earlier, you can't defend what you can't find, what you can't see. Um, so how do we understand the environment and then how do we empower the IT staff, even if they're only one or two folks, um, to, to engage with and manage that environment in a super like, uh, effective way um, when they're dealing with you know, hundreds or thousands of devices across hundreds, potentially tens to hundreds of vendors, like the configuration management alone is a nightmare. Um, so it's just incredibly kind of challenging stack of problems on top of the fact that if you make a mistake, or if your devices are out of commission, 
like you increase the mortality of your patients every time you increase the delay to care. Um, and so, you know, we don't really have a choice but to do better in that space. And so I'm really excited to see, we've had a lot of engagement across healthcare providers, across industry, um, you know, folks coming to the table with, you know, hey, we kind of had this idea for this space. Uh, let's let's see if we can make it work. Let's see if we can, you know, make a huge dent in this in this challenge. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to kind of see what we can do because it really is a tremendous, like just technical challenge. Um, uh, but I think, I think it's worth, obviously it's worth solving. Hell yeah. yeah. Woo! De DEFCON next, everybody. DEFCON next. <laughs> All right, Matt, do you want to pick up a little bit where that left off from the legacy perspective from, you know, not now's current FDA, but maybe in right. the past, right? Tell us a little bit about what your guys' evolution of thinking has been around it, around this. Yeah, um, a lot of our effort has started in the healthcare sector coordinating council and in the International Medical Device Regulators Forum or FDA involvement, not our anymore. Um, that it's vocal memory from eight and a half years there. It's hard to fight. Um, but a lot of the effort has been very collaborative, trying to get the healthcare perspective, the medical device manufacturer manufacturer perspective, um, as well as the regulator involvement. The legacy device problem is not going away anytime soon, um, especially since FDA's statutory authority for cybersecurity just took effect last year. Um, it's going to take some time for those better devices to fully help prevent some of the onset of the legacy device problem. A uh, lot of what we see in response to some of the issues to maintain continuity of care is, okay, well, we'll just make it not connected to the ethernet and that removes a lot of our risk. Um, but as we start to see devices evolve and additional functionality being added, once you start doing that, you can start impacting some of the intended use of that medical device and some of the core functionality that that device is providing. So there's a greater cost to some of those mitigations that were available on older products may no longer be available on some of the more recent products that are going out. So it's a complex issue. Um, it's also a regulated um, environment for updating and patching devices. So making sure that uh, addressing some of those challenges to make sure that the device is not impacted uh, by some of these updates to address some of the vulnerabilities. Um, it's going to take a kind of large collaborative effort to make sure that uh, all of the nuances, the challenges, and the best product for patients is um, what's ultimately achieved because at the end of the day, that's always been FDA's mission while I weren't there. It's always putting the patient first and putting the patient top of mind um, in all of our approaches, but the legacy device challenge is just one that's going to take a lot of government coordination as well as a lot of coordination across healthcare facilities and the medical device manufacturer community um, in order to get to workable solutions, not just for what's out there today, but also to maintain the devices that are currently out there and going to be going out there because the medical device life cycle is so different than traditional tech. Uh, clinicians will use a device until it no longer physically functions and that's a hard place to secure. Uh, so it's just addressing all of those challenges uh, and finding the right solutions and fixes. Fantastic. And I'm going to put you on the spot. I didn't tell you about this question. so it's not... <laughs> But I'm sure that healthcare is the only sector that you have to deal with that has this legacy problem, right? It's only healthcare. There are no lessons learned or stuff you figured out from other sectors that, you could that we could apply here. Uh, sarcasm. I mean, I'm assuming this is not a unique problem to healthcare. We talk about it a lot, but what are you seeing across other sectors that maybe we could learn a little bit from the healthcare side? I mean, I, I think Chris, it's not unique to the sector, which is probably a good thing and also a scary thing to some extent. What do we see across the board? I see a lot of Windows 95. <laughs> I see a lot of Clippy from Office, who I'm a fan of Clippy. I want to bring Clippy back, but like we really need to you know, look at what, what the next generation looks like. 
we, we've seen this in food and agriculture. We've seen this in the water sector. We've seen this in every sector as we go across the board. Because I, I think there's still a perception in most organizations that cybersecurity is a nuisance versus a necessity. And we need to make that pivot and get people to realize that this isn't just about being an inconvenience or taking down a unit or, an, and it, or part of your organization for a period of time so we can upgrade or patch, but it's a necessity to ensure the prompt and accurate and, and strong delivery of care and safe delivery of care. While frankly also, if people are looking at this really from a numbers perspective, it is in the best interest of an organization in the long run to, to take these steps early on. Um, you know, we see that we, so this is something we're seeing across the board, but it's frankly something that we need to change the entire landscape of how we're talking with everybody from CISOs to clinical personnel in the healthcare sector, but to CEOs and boards of directors to understand that we need to make this pivot from nuisance to necessity when it comes to, to patching, upgrading, and frankly, cybersecurity at large. We've made some progress. I talked to a lot of healthcare CEOs these days that are talking to me about their attack surface, which frankly, the fact that those two words are coming out of their mouth in that order is a wonderful thing, right? It means that they, they are acknowledging the fact that this is an issue. The fact that they know who their CISOs are and they're having these conversations is a huge step forward, but it's only the tip of the iceberg when you look at the breadth and scope of the healthcare sector of where we need to go. Awesome. All right, so who here feels a little, mo I mean, I, I promise, we started at Cake, now we're talking about depressing stuff, but I'm trying to bounce it back up a little bit and say, how many of you out there would volunteer with the skills you have as a hacker to try to make this problem better? Raise your hand. Yeah, that's awesome. I hope to see almost all your hands in the future. Many of you are already, but let's talk about kind of uh, what you can do a little bit, or maybe where, I think in some sense, we've seen some great growth in hackers involved in this, and maybe we can do a little bit more. So it's been 15, over 15 years of great medical device cybersecurity research. Devices like pacemakers, insulin pumps, all sorts of stuff has been shown at places like this. You know, Barnaby Jack, Jay Radcliffe, Billy Rios, and others, these are names that we talk about at DEF CON and Black Hat, um, and they contributed to these tremendous leaps in what happened at the FDA or what happened in the national conversation about medical device cybersecurity, and that came from folks like you. It came from hackers. You guys did something, you showed others, and it caused some amazing action to happen. But stuff's kind of changed a little bit. Anyone seen a really good medical device uh, hack on on a big stage at Black Hat or DEF CON recently? No. The question I have is we have great spaces like the Biohacking Village. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, you definitely should, where hackers can get their hands on medical devices. But do we need to do more? Do we need to be giving more medical devices, more exposure to the folks in this room that have that power and maybe do what Jay and Kevin Fu and and others did 10 years ago to change things. So to the, to the audience, what should we do? How do we get these folks out here more engaged in medical devices or healthcare cybersecurity infrastructure or whistleblower? I mean, I think if, uh, if Apple could provide security researchers with devices, even if there is you know, some rigor morale to get, to get access to them, um, the idea that you could get access to firmware for medical devices, the, the model that the biohacking village has started, um, feels like something that we can scale and we could scale and have a significant impact um, and do it doing it really in a very once again very collaborative way like there is so much good intent and so much capability in this community um, and reward that you know reward success in that space uh, and just the the dividends would be tremendous across the the sector um, and I think the the upfront investment actually wouldn't necessarily be significant if we choose to take that action right like it's, it's all fundamentally a choice that we need to make first um, across regulators uh, manufacturers uh, research agencies, but you know, if we make that choice, we commit a little bit and like, I think we will see massive returns very quickly. Um, so yeah, let's make that choice. So I'd say from the medical device perspective, there's a great benefit in that the new statutory requirements for connected medical devices includes that the manufacturer has to have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process um, so that it should become easier to access people at the company if you're able to um, identify potential vulnerabilities in a product. I will say one of the challenges and one of the uh, things that the people that you named um, had a immense amount of patience, um, especially for 
the older products that take longer to patch that had uh, older devices, uh, devices that don't have as easy delivery mechanisms for patching and updates uh, in order to ensure patient safety in that responsible disclosure of the vulnerabilities. Sometimes those take time um, in order to process and develop, have the manufacturer develop patches to address the issues. Uh, but now that coordinated vulnerability disclosure is a requirement for new products, that should become a easier process. But definitely keep in mind that there is that patient safety aspect um, that may take cause the disclosure to take a little longer than you would like. Um, but you can still go through the process, still um, engage with the manufacturer, still get the appropriate credit and while maintaining that patient safety consideration. Just a, just kind of a follow up to that. I think talking to folks in the security research community, uh, especially if we're looking at like academic research, access to devices is the number one reason that we don't, I think, see more work in this space. Um, and there are a lot of con they're clapping for you, but they're next door. <laughs> Not everyone at DEF CON is clapping for me while I'm talking. I, I appreciate the vibe. Though. <laughs> um, uh, like, if you don't have access to any of the kind of artifacts of a device, it is very hard to assess its, sec its security properties. Um, and I think that's where we see, I mean, if, if, if you know, controlling the, the ecosystem um, may be disadvantageous in the long run or, or, or limiting access, like, like the pro of a, providing more avenues for controlled access or, or just identifying what level of control is actually necessary to maintain whatever interest you have in the device's safety, in your own business, whatever. Um, I think reassessing kind of those those parameters uh, and then engaging more with the community, uh, like, like grad students can do a whole lot of really good work for, you know, not a whole lot of money. Like thank, thank the NSF and NIH, like, like we can see via their work in other spaces in other sectors even, other critical infrastructure sectors. So we have the ability, we have the talent and we know kind of what it costs. Um, so I think unleashing and kind of like building more work in that space could be a very cost effective um, and also security effective way of getting more, more kind of progress uh, here. But once again, it requires the choice to kind of open yourself up to that, that relationship and that community. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about because it, it's, you're, you're right, right? We don't see that a lot. Like the biohacking village is very unique kind of in this respect or, or you know, there are other efforts across the nation. I'm not trying to discount those, but um, we could do more. Absolutely. I, you shouldn't have to hack on your own medical device that you own because, and that helps you be alive to do cool cutting edge research, right? You shouldn't have to go on eBay and buy the only device available for you in a device category that's 10 years old or 15 years old and has, of course you're gonna find stuff because you can't get your hands on the latest and greatest. You know, I really wonder if that's holding us back. And it's just then a game of, if I could get a hold of it, I could find something, but I'm not going to and it's gonna just float along. We miss an opportunity to really make some meaningful change earlier. Um, so that's a plea to the plea to the audience. Get involved. Who would who would take a medical device home and wrench on it if you could? Yeah, hell yeah. No drug delivery pumps for you guys though, okay? <laughs> no fentanyl pumps, all right? We're not... All right. Consolidation. Okay, here we go. Smaller uh give me a round I want an audience poll real quick. Raise your hand if you think the profit margins of most hospitals in this country is over twenty percent. Raise your hand. All right, keep your hand up. 10%, 5%, 1%. Yeah, you guys know. It's about 1%. Sub 1%, meaning your hospital makes a profit margin probably of between 1% and 4%. And then if they don't, if they screw something up, they go red. More and more hospitals are getting financially distressed. And I want to just hear if anyone in this audience knows what happens. You have a hospital system, it's in the red. And then what is it going to do to survive? Is it going to see more patients or become more efficient? No, it's going to get bought. It's going to get consolidated. What happens when hospital system A buys hospital system B? Do you think they're going to have two different uh, entire technology stacks? No, they're going to unify under one stack, right? What happens when more and more hospitals are just part of more and more mega healthcare delivery organization conglomerates 
and one of them gets hit. And then not only is it then one or two hospitals that are down, it's 200 over four states. The question I have is from a national security perspective, as something that we should do from folks that are interested in this, making sure hospitals can function, you know, how should we look at the consolidation of healthcare delivery organizations when it comes to risk of catastrophic failure? And is there anything we can do when hospital systems try to marry one another that could limit this? So to the panel. So I'll, also I'll, I'll offer, I think we are looking at this and, and having a lot of conversations about really understanding risk. And I think we look at risk in not necessarily in the right light when it comes to cybersecurity. I look at risk as a three-legged stool. There's risk identification, we spend a lot of time on that. There's risk mitigation, we spend a lot of time on that. The third leg of the stool is risk acceptance. And we don't spend enough time understanding the risks that we're accepting in our organizations by not investing in, in cybersecurity or modernization and infrastructure. That risk acceptance is not the CISO. That risk acceptance is the CEOs and the boards of directors of organizations that are deciding to not invest. I get the margins issue. I, I worked in healthcare. I, I'm, we were never even in the 1%, so I think that's a great, we would love to have been in the 1%. Um, so I, I think that there's those types of challenges that folks are balancing against, but people need to understand the risks that they're accepting. I will say that we are hearing more healthcare organizations talking about tech debt and cyber risk in the M&A process. You know, they're having these discussions of saying, we want to buy this healthcare system or this hospital, and we know that it's going to cost us $2 million, $3 million, $4 million to get their IT to the standards that we have set within our organization. And they're building that into the M&A discussion when it comes to that. Now, that being said, that's a small fraction of the, of the conversations that are happening. So I think it's a multi-pronged approach. One, we want to make sure that we're able to get that message out to folks and change the way that we're looking at M&A within healthcare so that people are factoring in tech debt and cybersecurity uh, as part of that dialogue. And I think the other piece of it is, and is making sure that we understand, going back to the first question about mapping out the sector, where are those key dependencies where something is, you know, we're, you know, we know this with the HR, we know this obviously would change, uh, but there's other types of events that we don't know what's out there, where the, there's these entities that are have such large market share that the impact to one becomes an impact to more than we can tolerate in healthcare. We need to know that so we can start having those discussions of buying down that risk or going in collectively and accepting that risk. And we have not been able to do that effectively yet where we need to in the healthcare sector. Oh, oh mergers and acquisitions. Sorry, thank you. Anyone else? Um, I'd say in terms of consolidation, I'd say what can we learn from other international models where there are single payer systems that have large networks of facilities? Are there things that we can learn to address some of those risks based off of what we see and them do well or them have issues with? And how can we adopt what has worked well um, or improve upon what hasn't? Uh, but I'd say it's definitely something we need to pay careful attention to and see what protections can be in place to isolate facilities in case one gets hit to ensure that continuity of care, especially if it's in an overlapping region, you don't want to lose an entire region of facilities uh, based off of it hitting the central core facility or just affecting the entire network. So how can we get better detection and automa automated response uh, capabilities in order to cut off those networks when exposed. All right, I wanna make sure we can get through some questions here. And this ha has a whistleblower component, I think, which is be an interesting part. We'd like to pull on that a little bit in here. For years, we have known very little in what happens inside hospitals that have been hit with ransomware. Every once in a while, you'll get a news report that says an attack happened, and you'll hear some updated news reports that the attack's still going on. Maybe you'll get an anonymous quote from a doctor or a nurse that worked at the hospital, but for the longest times, we had no idea, really. With rare exception, maybe, I'm just gonna shout out uh, University of Vermont, right? They've been incredibly transparent in their attack. Well, as a consequence of not sharing that information very openly and exhaustively is we don't get lessons learned. Right? We don't know what happened when they're taking care of their diabetic patients that were in a, in a crisis or their heart attacks or their strokes. We don't really learn like we should. 
And there are some uh, organizations like ISACs and these types of things, but clearly there seems to be an information vacuum. Do we offer some additional legal protections, some type of additional efforts that we can do to make health systems feel more comfortable about talking about their failures so other people can learn from it? To the audience, or sorry, to the, to the panel? So I think you see in other domains where people make upfront disclosures that say if they are in violation of some sort of tenant, like foreign corrupt practices, that there will be leniencies in terms of the fees that they might incur. Um, but I think it is to this point of like getting that board buy-in, getting that executive buy-in to say like mistakes are going to be made and we're here to fix them. And that there's an immense amount of power in deconstructing the narrative of exactly what went wrong and the details of that. Because even for a cybersecurity failure, it's not just one or two things. It's probably a list of 30 different decisions that were made and being able to have really clear granularity of who made what decisions, who was affected, who was unaware, whatever those details are, being very explicit, very clear, and really being able to dig in the weeds of those retrospective analysis, and not only sharing them internally with those, those organizations, but also externally to other people who work in the cybersecurity in industry is immensely helpful. Um, but I think psychologically very hard, right? It's hard even though you may be valued by other cybersecurity professionals for being transparent and open and admitting a mistake. Uh, the public perception of that could be seen while you were in negligent or, or everything else. And, I, and that sort of shift in people's perception of when people make mistakes is also a bit of a, a challenge there. So you can see that there's maybe some sort of incentivization structure that you can create to say you'll get leniency if you're very clear at reporting what went wrong, how it went wrong in very, very specified details. Or alternatively, again, it's like this is a, a deliberate decision typically by people in positions of leadership to say transparency is important to us. Being able to say we are engineers, we are going to fail, that is the nature of engineering, but we are also here to fix. And this is how we fixed it. And for the benefit of our industry, here is the details of, of how we resolved that issue. And I think having those case studies is, is crucially important for, for basically any field that you're really in. Um, but, it's, but it's a tricky problem, right? Because it's a, a public perception, it's a liability issue or a perceived liability issue. And it's like, how do you overcome those hurdles is, is more of a people problem, I would see, than a, a technical problem or, um, uh, in the, yeah, it's than a technical problem at the end of the day. I think, I mean, kind of building on that, like, looking at the FAA and how we deal with aviation incidents. I mean, I think there was a recognition that the entire industry, like if people did not feel safe flying, that entire sector would collapse. And so the need for transparency, the processes that have been put in place, um, like are they perfect? Probably not, I'm not an expert in that field, but there is a high degree of industry and government cooperation. There's a high degree of transparency. There's a high degree of kind of forensic capacity built into um, the systems that we use to ensure for like commercial flight. Um, and so, uh, or like the NTSB kind of in, to a lesser degree, but like things that we have decided are necessary for the economy, for like the nation to kind of like move forward every day. We, we find a way to achieve more transparency and more cooperation. Um, and so it'd be really interesting just to see, uh, you know, how, how can we do that for healthcare? Because this is also a necessity, um, just very, very complex one. Um, uh, but I think the fundamental kind of like problem and the, and the, maybe, maybe the solution looks similar. All right. I've gotten the less than five minutes. And I know we had talked a little bit about a Q and a, but I don't think we're going to be able to take a Q and a, is that correct? Yeah, unfortunately not blame this, blame this person. I'm just kidding. Blame me, uh, the monitor. What I will offer is I'll be available in the back, but we want to be respectful to the next speakers. I can't uh, guarantee any of these folks that are very busy. They may or may not be able to answer some questions, but I want to say from the bottom of my heart, and I hope you out there agree, thank you so much for coming and giving us your knowledge today on this very complicated topic. Everyone, give them a round of applause. <laughs>